why don't you turn with me in, in your scriptures uh, in the Bible to Matthew chapter 24. You know, at the first, it's the, of course the first Sunday of a new year. So, you know, uh, you know, we could have talked about setting goals today. We could have talked about, you know, uh, uh, all of the uh, things that a new year brings to mind. You know, what are the blessings that we're hoping for uh, from the Lord, etc. But uh, today, I, I just was led into the scripture here at Matthew uh, chapter twenty-four and verse three. Now, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us, when will these things be? Of course, Jesus was talking uh, uh, about the um, uh, destruction of the temple and, and things like that uh, to the disciples. And uh, this, uh, this question, when will these things be and, and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And, and these, uh, these questions lead Jesus into uh, what ends up being a several chapters of the book of Matthew of uh, discussion of the end times and uh, uh, end things and, and uh, all of those things and where Jesus uh, continues uh, to give uh, several parables, etc., uh, that discuss the, um, the end of the age and teach us about the kingdom uh, of heaven and what the kingdom of heaven, what the kingdom of God uh, is like. And how do, how do we relate to it? And in, in Matthew 24, 3, uh, of course, the disciples are asking Jesus this question. Um, and Jesus uh, gives them an answer that, you know, is, is, is interesting. Uh, uh, turning over uh, to the 36th verse, Jesus uh, says to them, uh, after giving them, you know, some information about the end days and all of that, he says to them, but look, uh, of that day and hour, no one knows. Of that day and that hour, no one knows. Uh, really, he, he, he says that it's, you know, uh, not even the angels of heaven, uh, but my Father only. So, you know, Jesus in his, in his incarnate state, Jesus didn't even know. In his incarnate state. Now, you know, with him uh, being with the Father in heaven, does he know now? I don't know. Beats me. I don't think scripture is clear on it. But in his incarnate state, he didn't know. He might know now, you know, but, you know, really it's kind of irrelevant. Uh, in that day and hour, no one knows. So then as we head into this new year, you know, and uh, Kevin Miller was out at uh, uh, Global Awakenings Church uh, this weekend for head of the year conference, you know, as he's, he's uh, they're starting the, uh, the new year with a conference out there this weekend. So he was out there to get inspiration and uh, uh, receive the word of the Lord, et cetera, for a new year, you know, coming, coming into a new year. How do we relate to that? A new year, it's, it's, you know, every year God, you know, recycles, right? But recycling sounds old, doesn't it? When you recycle something, it sounds like, uh, you know, something old, Right? But it's not meant to be that way. God gives us each year a, a natural uh, inclination, a natural opportunity, even in the sun, the moon, the stars, the sky, the earth, in all of creation, God has given mankind a natural point at which to look forward, to look back and say, okay, here's where I've been, to look back and say, boy, I can see where I screwed that up. Now I'm going to, going to move forward and go again. I'm going to move forward. I'm going to start again. I'm going to take stock of where I've been, but I'm going to look ahead to what the future holds. I'm going to look ahead to what, uh, what can I do? Where can I place my hope in God? What can I do to change my circumstances? Anybody have any circumstances they'd like to change? Yeah. Amen? Yeah. I have some circumstances I'd like to change. You know, I'm too fat. I had to buy a bigger belt. <laughs> Isn't that a terrible thing? What a terrible thing. I could have got by with a size smaller. You can see I'm already, I bought a new belt and I'm already on the last hole. <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, so, you know. 
That's one circumstance I'd like to change, but that's just an outward thing. Is that really important? Uh, you know, it has some importance, you know, for health and all of that. But is it really important? It's not as important as the other things. It's not as important as drawing closer to God. It's not as important as getting rid of my laziness that keeps me from prayer. It's not as important as, 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 as getting, uh, getting uh, over, overcoming fear that causes us to, to not move forward in our lives and, and to, to stagnate. You know, Israel had an opportunity to stagnate at the, at the River Jordan. They had an opportunity to stagnate right there. Because they had, in order to, to move forward in life, to move forward as a nation, to move forward as a people, they had to cross a river. Not only did they have to cross that river, they had to, to cross it at flood tide. The time of the year, you know, my God, don't you know better, Lord? Right? You know, they could have looked and said, well, God, what is it with you? Right? You don't ask us to cross the river when it's crossable. You ask us to cross the river when it's flooding. And they had a, they had a, God didn't give them the word to say build a bridge. He didn't give them a, a plan for an ark. Or, uh, or, or, you know, say, hey, go on over to, you know, uh, to the uh, Lebanon and mine some timbers, you know, get some timbers and bring them back here and build a bridge. He said, walk right in. Walk right in to, to that water. And, of course, we know what happened when they stepped in the water, right? You know the, 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 what happened when they stepped in that water, there was a little stream, uh, they, they stepped into those floodwaters, and the waters of the Jordan rolled back, just like the Red Sea rolled back. And, and, and you know, I don't know, when I was a kid, I never heard about that. Did you? I mean, when I was a kid, I heard about the, the, the parting of the Red Sea, but I never heard about the parting of the Jordan. Never heard about that. And when, you know, it's, it's very, very interesting. I think you know this. I mean, I know I've preached this before. I think you know this. But when they, when they hit those waters, when they walked into those flood waters, you know, they were exhibiting a, a, a complete faith and trust in God. I mean, no, you know, we, we had recent floods in the, in the Midwest and in Texas and everything, right? And, and all down through the Mississippi Valley. Those floodwaters ravaged homes. I don't know how many were killed. The last, I, I had heard a number of 16 at one point, people that were killed and, and just millions and millions of dollars worth of damages, et cetera, to homes, et cetera. The floodwaters, when they come through, they, they ravage. You, you know, you can't really stand against floodwaters that are just moving. And, and, and these people were, were told by God to walk into those waters, and they, and they did. And as they walked into those waters, when they hit those waters, the waters stood up. And the Bible says that it, it stood up as far upstream as Adam. There was a little town called Adam, about 11 miles upstream from from the point where the Israelites had, had gone to forge the, the river. And those floodwaters just stood up all the way upstream to Adam. I believe that it's, it's just like that with us, that all the way back to Adam, back to our, our initial, if you will, original sin, were cleansed by, those, uh, by faith in Christ. When we take that step in, when we step into those waters of the gospel of Christ, we step in. Now it's time. It's a new year. It's time to cross over that threshold and into something new. It's time to cross over that threshold and enter in 
to that new thing. Jesus said that no one knows the day or the hour when, he's, when his return will be. He says, not even the angels of heaven, but only his Father. So, but, but we do know what our job is, right? Until he returns, we know what our job is. Our job is to occupy. Not to, not to occupy as in the sense of just keeping busy, but to occupy as in the sense of a, of a, a, a conquering power, occupying a, a, a conquered land, so to speak. That's how we're to occupy. Not in the sense of just, you know, keeping busy or occupying ourselves. Sometimes, you know, we might have a little time on our hands and we want to occupy ourselves just doing whatever. But how much time do we give thought, how, how often do we give thought to really occupying our, our spiritual uh, place, our spiritual land, occupying it uh, with the presence of the Lord, occupying it in his presence, occupying uh, in prayer. How do we win our battles? We're, we're not going to win naturally. We're not, right, we don't wear, wrestle with flesh and blood but we wrestle with principalities and powers. We wrestle in the spiritual realm, and this is how we're going to win. This is how the, the kingdom of heaven progresses forward against the enemy. Not, we're not going to, you know, uh, you know we're, we're not going to uh, defeat ISIS uh, just militarily. Because I can tell you, listen to me. The United States government can send all its firepower. Do you hear me? We can destroy ISIS to the last man. And next year, a new group will rise up doing the same thing. Why? It's a spirit. It's the prince of Persia spoken of in the book of Daniel. That's exactly what it is. And we can take ISIS out and we should, you know... We should. We should defend Christians militarily if we must because we have the ability to do so. And therefore, incumbent with ability, incumbent uh, with, with natural power comes natural responsibility. It's a spiritual principle. It's a spiritual principle to defend the weak. When God speaks in the, in the Bible of defending the weak, is he, what's he talking about? What's he talking about? Physically intervening on behalf of the weak. My wife has told this story in church before, but a perfect example of it. I remember, uh, you know, I mean, now you know my wife's health. You know what her health situation is like, and, you know, she's dealt with some of these issues for many, many years. But uh, a number of years ago, she, she was uh, on our front porch and across the street coming home from school. We live on a, on a, well, uh, on a very well-traveled route for kids coming home from school. And a bunch of the high school kids were coming home from school. And all of a sudden, at, at the corner just below 9th Street on Wannett, erupted a, a kind of like a gang fight. But the problem is it wasn't a gang fight so much as it was a gang against one. Now, we don't know, you know, Angie and I don't know what that kid did, but what we do know and what she, what she knew was that kid was going to get his head pounded out. And, and literally, they were uh, ready to, to do this, and she rushed across the street and right into the midst of them, what was she doing? The biblical mandate. The biblical mandate to protect the weak. That one kid wouldn't have had a, a, a chance. And she rushed across the street and into the midst of that crowd and, and protected the weak. We 
We don't know the day or the hour of Jesus is coming, but we know what we're to be doing. We're to be changing uh, uh, the atmosphere, changing the world by our prayers. It's what we're to be doing. It's who we are. It is what we are to be doing, what we are to be about. Jesus in Matthew 24 goes on and he, he tells them, you know, to, uh, gives, gives a warning to his disciples. He says, listen, there, there'll be many false prophets and all of that. And he says, and because lawlessness will abound. Now today is a, 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 certainly a, a good example of a day when lawlessness abounds. Well, would you agree with me on that? There is a certain lawlessness in, in the world and in our country, in our society, there's a lawlessness. There's places in the country the police won't go. You know? I mean, they just won't go there. There's a lawlessness that abounds uh, in our nation, but not only in our nation, in the world. There's lawlessness that abounds. And because of that, What's, what's, the, what's the issue with that? What, what is the issue that God talks about with that? He says, because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold, but he who endures to the end shall be saved. Now that word endures, I, you know, in, in the English, when we read that, what do we get the picture of? Enduring to the end. Just holding on by the skin of our teeth, by our fingertips, as, as, you know, a team of wild horses tries to drag us, and we are clinging to something, enduring to the end. That's the picture that those words in English conjure up in our mind, right? Or maybe it's just me, but it's kind of how, how it appears or how it seems. But th those words really mean to hold one's ground in, con in a conflict. To hold one's ground. To stay in position. To stay in place. I was watching uh, football. A little, I, I got to watch a little bit of the uh, football games over the weekend, you know. Uh, if you're a college football fan like I am, I, I like college even better than the pro uh, game. And um, uh, just watching that, there was the announcers kept saying about this one particular team, uh, you know, they've got to stay in their lanes when they're on kickoff coverage or on punt return coverage. They got to stay in their lanes because this return man that the other team had was a dangerous return man. And several times during the game, uh, that guy took a, a punt on the 20-yard line and returned it to the 50. It was just, you know, 20, 30, 40-yard returns because the other team didn't stay in their lanes. If they, if they on the coverage team, on the kick coverage team, if they stay in their lanes, you've got the field covered. And there won't be so many creases for that player to run. So they were talking about staying in position, enduring to the end, holding one's ground. Staying in one's position. The Bible says that we are all bricks. You know, Pink, Pink Floyd said we're all bricks in the wall. The Bible says that we are all bricks in the church. Right? We're all bricks in, in the church, in the spiritual habitation. We're being built together for, for uh, a, a spiritual habitation for the Lord. We're being built together. We're being built up together as a spiritual habitation for the Lord. We, we have to occupy the space that we're called to occupy. See, that, that word occupy there, again, is a military term. It's not a, not a term of just saying, oh, you know, keep yourself busy. Well, da, 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 da. It's a military term, occupy. This term endure, hold one's ground in conflict, to hold up under adversity and under stress. It means to persevere, 
It's an action word. We oft think of endurance as a, not as an action word, but more as a, you know, a, a, a mental thing. Where, where we just hang on mentally no matter what. And, that, and, and that's an aspect of it. But it means to persevere, to keep trying. It means to, to stand your ground, to hold your position. That is an active thing. If you've ever been in the trenches, of, you know, I'll go, again, go back to football. If you've ever been in the trenches in, in, in a football uh, you know, situation, you know, the, the defense fires out, the offense fires out trying to push back and get a surge on the line of scrimmage to move that defensive line. And the defensive line tries to fire low to hold their position, to try to fill the gaps for the running back so the running back has nowhere to go, right? There's, there's two forces opposing, two forces Opposing, holding your ground in, 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 a, in a time of battle is not a, a passive thing. Listen, so often we are so passive in prayer. So passive. So passive. It's time that we break that passiveness. It's time that we break our, our, our passive uh, uh, tone our passive tenor, our passive uh, uh, response, if you will, uh, in prayer. He endures to the end, shall be saved. Energetic resistance. Brave. Calm. Perseverance in the face of adversity. We talked about the Israelites a little bit ago. We were saying about how they had to cross that river, and that river was at flood stage. And they, they by faith, had to step into that water. And when they stepped in and that water rolled all the way back to Adam, and, and, and I believe God was just washing away their, their sin, so to speak and bringing them into the promised land. What a picture of our salvation. How glorious a, a picture of our salvation. But they had to, to march forward. They had to enter in. They had to go in. And they had to overcome their fear. You remember how many times in the, in the book of Joshua, in the first one to two chapters of that book of Joshua, and I think even at the uh, uh, last chapter or so of the preceding book, it, it, it's saying about uh, be strong and courageous. In that first chapter of the book of Joshua, it just says over and over and over, be strong and courageous. Be strong and courageous. Be strong and courageous. We have to be strong. We have to be courageous. And listen, we have to tell ourselves to do that. How often do you wake up in the morning and you don't feel like getting out of bed or you don't feel like doing what you have to do? Right? And you have to remind yourself, get up, be strong, be courageous, do what I have to do today. We have to do that. We have to do that in prayer also. Now, I, I, I want to get in, into this point just a little bit. He who endures to the end shall be saved, right? So we now know that endurance is not just hanging on, clinging, you know, while, uh, while we're being drug away. That's, you know what I mean. But look at what it says. For the love of many shall wax cold because lawlessness abounds. The love of many shall wax cold. But. But. Now that, that, that little word but is, is a connecting word. And it connects the thought that comes to the thought before it. 
You hear me? And it's important we don't miss that sometimes, that we don't miss that because you can miss that right here very easily. Because lawlessness shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold, but he who endures to the end shall be saved. Now, what does it take to endure? The connecting word just told us. I just gave you the answer. The connecting word tells you what it takes to endure. But the love of many will wax cold. How do we endure? By not letting our love run cold. By not waxing cold to those around us to our neighbors, to our friends, to strangers, by keeping our love functioning, we avoid uh, failure. We, we avoid defeat. We keep our love growing. We keep our love functioning. He who endures to the end shall be saved. We endure, we win by keeping our love functioning, by keeping our love intact. So what does that look like? What does that look like? Well, we can, we can come up with all kinds of things. I could, put a, I could get Bob to put something on the board and he'd put it up there and we'd have all kinds of points, right? And we could come up with those together uh, right now, come up with all kinds of things. But what did Jesus say? See, Jesus was all in one dissertation here, talking about the end of days, talking about the tribulations that were to come, et cetera, et cetera. And he says, look, if you want to overcome, if you want to overcome all this, don't let your love go cold. Keep your love hot. Keep your love hot. And then he tells a couple of parables. He tells a couple of parables. The parable of the wise and foolish virgins. We, you know that, right? Matthew 25. You know that. And that's a parable about the, you know, the, uh, the end time and the end of days when the bridegroom returns. And, and what's the key to that parable? The key to that parable is to be prepared. When the Lord returns, who's he coming back for? Scripture says it this way. The scripture says he comes back for those who are looking for his appearing. In other words, for those who are prepared. For those who are, are ready for him. For those who are prepared. And in this parable the, 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 uh, of the uh, ten virgins, five were prepared, five were not. Five of them were prepared, five were not. The five had, had trimmed their wicks, and, and what else had they done? Right, five, five of them ran out of oil, and five did not. Five of them took a supply, if you will, of the Holy Spirit with them. <laughs> now, now, how are you going to do that? That's number one. That is number one. If you have yet to read Bishop Hammond's book on praying in tongues, 25, what is that? I think it's 20, 70, okay, see, a boy, I, whoa, man, I was, 70 reasons why believers should pray in tongues. 70 reasons to pray in the Holy Ghost. If you have yet to read that book, you ought to read it. These 10 virgins, five of them took a supply of the Holy Ghost with them. In other words, they were prepared. They stayed in prayer. They, they continued to pray and continued to press into God when, when the bridegroom delayed. When God delayed in their lives, if you will. <clears throat> they stayed prepared. They stayed prayed up. They, they uh, uh, kept seeking him. They had a, a supply of oil. It's funny how the, the oil, just like the widow's oil in the story with Elijah, or uh, Elisha it was, 
how, how the widow poured the oil into the, into the uh, vessels, and as long as they had vessels, the oil kept pouring. This, is just like, this oil is just like that oil. It'll keep pouring as long as we're a willing vessel. As long as we continue to seek Him, as long as we are willing vessels, that oil will keep flowing. It's new every day. God's mercies are new every day. Every morning, His mercies are new. And then he, he tells the, the parable of the, of the talents. Right after the parable of the wise and foolish virgins, he, Jesus goes into the parable of the talents. And, and what's he talk about? What again is the key to, to that parable? What's the key to that parable? Using what God has given you. Being prepared, preparedness. Using what God has given you. Look at, uh, uh, of course, you know this story. Uh, you know this story, right? Uh, the, uh, a man was going away on a long journey, on a long uh, journey, and he, he called his servants together, and to the first one he gave uh, ten talents, or five talents. To the next one he gave two talents, and to the next one he gave one talent. And then he went away on his journey, Right? And the guy that had the, the well, let, let me clarify something. A talent, I figured it out this morning, is about $720,000. Woo! Yeah, it kind of, you know, I used to think a talent was a, a, a one silver coin. Ah, you know, a silver coin's nice, but it's not. Put it in today's money. A talent was about 6,000 denarii, a denarius was about a day's wages for a laborer. What's a laborer make? Where I work, a, a, a general laborer makes about $15 an hour. Take that 15 times 8 is 120. Take that times 6, it's 700 and, and something, or 800 and, what is that, times 6, 720, right? 120 times 6 be 720. Take that times 6,000, or by 1,000, and what would you have? $720,000. So one talent was $720,000. That was a rich man that was given this, these goods to a servant. I, I, I bring that out just to say that if you look at that in today's monies, it, it's not some small thing. We have been given so much. We have been blessed beyond blessed beyond blessed, given so much. Yet sometimes, be honest, isn't it easy to, to get ungrateful, to grumble, to growl, to not appreciate what we've been given, what we have, what, what God has done for us? Isn't it easy to fall into that trap? He who received the five talents went and traded and made five more. He who received two went and gained two more. He who received one went and dug into the ground and hid his Lord's money. What we've been given, God doesn't want us to hide. In fact, you know the, you know the story, and I'm paraphrasing. The man finally, eventually, after a long time, returned and when he returned, he, he settled accounts with his servants. And, and the servant came with the five talents and, and uh, uh, said, you know, I've taken your five talents and gained five more. Here's ten talents. Notice one thing about that servant. That servant didn't come back and he didn't say, I took your five talents and I invested them and I made five more talents. I'm going to keep two and here's your eight. What God gives, what God gives us, the increase is His also. The increase is His also. It's all His. 
See, we, we, I believe that this speaks to us uh, uh, in the issue of finances and tithing. Everything is his. Everything is his, period. It's all his. It all belongs to him, period. So uh, we know then the one that had two talents came back and said, Master, I've made two more talents, and, and you know, here's your four talents. And then finally the one with the, with the one talent comes back and he says, Master, I, I knew you to be a hard man. And, and uh, now, you know, here's something that I, I think we miss. Here's something I think we miss. Master, I knew you to be a hard man. And therefore, I took your money and I dug in the ground and I hid your one talent. Here's your one talent. Now, what that tells me is that that servant didn't really know his master at all. If he did, he knew his master expected increase. He didn't really know his master. He didn't really know him. If he knew him, he would have known that he better do the right thing with his master's money and, and increase it. And this is, this is one of the things that we as, as believers should be looking to increase. Now, I'm not, you know, financially and, and in, in many, many ways. I'm not just talking financially. In fact, the finances here, is a, this is a financial principle, a principle of increase, et cetera. But... It's the finances are just um, the example. You, under, you understand? It's it's really the um, in every way, in all things, we should be looking for increase, increase in in our uh, uh, prosperity. Uh, John uh, was it, it was John that wrote, "Beloved, I I pray above all things that you may prosper and be in good health, even as your soul prospers." Right. John was, what was John really concerned with there? Beloved, I, 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 I pray that you prosper. But what was he really concerned with? With their soul. Even as your soul prospers, the soul prospering was the key to the whole thing. The knowledge of God and growing in grace and knowledge of him and knowing him. This servant really didn't know his master, not at all. And, and his Lord answered to him and he said to him, you wicked and lazy servant. Now, he equates laziness with wickedness, right? You know, thank God we're not lazy, right? He equates laziness and wickedness, he equates them uh, to one another. You wicked and lazy servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seeds. So you ought to have deposited my money and, and at my coming, I would have received back my own with interest. Therefore, take the talent from him and give it to him who has ten talents. You see, we see here a principle, and the principle is that when we don't utilize what we have, what we've been given, when we don't utilize it, we lose what even we have. And this, this uh, can happen. This can happen. We, we see it as... It is a, 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 a principle, if you will. But what, and I think this is important, what stopped that servant? Master, I, I, I was afraid. And I went and dug in the ground and hid your money. That's exactly what he said. Master, I was afraid. This year, we need to overcome fear. We as a, as a people, we need to overcome fear, step out, and move forward in the areas that God is speaking to us to move forward. What stops us from enduring? Fear. I was afraid. Look at... Um, we, we talked about, I, I want to just clarify them. We, we talked about that, that our, we don't endure 
if we allow our love to wax cold. So what, what does that look like? Jesus gives us a, a, you know, a, a way of looking at that, and he says in, in verse 31, in this passage, in, in uh, verse 31 of, of chapter 25, he says, When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him. And he will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. It's going to be quite a scene, isn't it? All the nations, all the nations of the earth. I don't know how that's all possible for all the nations of the earth to be gathered before him. It's certainly going to be on a level uh, uh, and a scale like nothing we've ever seen, right? It'll be greater than our greatest uh, coliseums and greater than our greatest, uh, you know, football stadiums. And it'll be... Uh, it'll be like the entire earth flattened and, and becomes one giant uh, stadium, if you will. All the earth will be gathered before him, every nation. And all the nations be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from another as the shepherd divides the sheep. And he'll set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on his left. Bishop Hammond speaks of, of sheep and goat nations. He says that entire nations may be judged. Sheep and goat uh, nations. And he'll set the sheep on his right hand and the goats on the left. And then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And, he, and, and then he tells why. He tells why. And I believe we can liken this right back to our love not growing cold. For I was hungry, you gave me food. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was a stranger, you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. And then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or feed you or, or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, and as much as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. And he will say to those on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty. You gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not take me in. Naked, you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. And then they will also answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick in prison and did not minister to you? And then he, he will answer them, saying, Surely I say to you, inasmuch as you did not do it to the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. So we have to keep our love hot. We have to keep our love fervent. We have to keep our love uh, functioning and flowing. It's a day and an age where it would be easy to not allow our love to function, not allow our love to flow, not allow our, our, our mercy and and. And, and peace to extend to others. It's a day and an age when it's so, um, there's so much anger everywhere. There's anger in the music. There's anger on the TV. There's anger in the news broadcast. You ever, you know, you can really just get sick of watching the news because they're all so angry. <laughs> all the newscasters are angry. They used to all be angry. You know, years ago, you could watch the news and the newsmen just gave you the news. Now they're, they're all so angry, it's just ridiculous, you know? Now, I don't care if that's, you know, Fox News, CNN, CNBC, or whoever. It doesn't matter. They're all the same. They're all angry. And they're all, they're all uh, uh, spouting a, a, an ideology that has nothing to do with the Lord, has to do with their own opinions. Uh, that's, we'll stay off the politics, I guess, <laughs> for, for a moment. But uh, I want you to look, you know, how, 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 do we, how do we endure, how do we possess? This is a, a, a year uh, of breakthrough. It's a year of jubilee, right? 
All of, how are we going to possess these things? How are we going to how are we going to possess? How are we going to endure? How are we going to uh, break through? How are we going to do that? Perfect love certainly has. We we truly have uh, to seek the Lord to help us in that area because we're weak in that area. I don't mean we necessarily as a congregation, or I just mean we as a as humanity. Humanity, we tend to be weak in that area. We have to overcome fear. We have to overcome fear. We have to overcome laziness. And I know, you know, I mean, I look around this room, there's some hardworking people here, you know. I know that. And, uh, um, but when I talk, the laziness that I talk about is the spiritual laziness. It's so easy to think, oh, you know, you know, I'm saved and I know it and I'm going to heaven and I know it and all of that, but then not to press in further. Not to wrestle on behalf of, of others around us. Not to love others around us. Not to, not to battle for the, for the heart, minds, and souls of, of our neighbors and our loved ones. I was very uh, happy. Recently I ran into a, a very old dear friend. guy that, you know, I just, I just love this man. I just love him, and you know the thing is, I, I I have seen him very few times over over the whatever last thirty years. Uh, doesn't matter. I still I, just, I I love the guy, and him and I were very fast friends when as as uh, young guys, and and we you know honestly we ran around and partied together and all of that, and uh, it wasn't a, a healthy situation. But he and I just had a love for one another, and. Um, I ran into him uh, very recently in, in, uh, in the Wise Market. And, you know, we stood there in the Wise Market, and I was so happy because I, I, when I ran into him, we were talking a little bit, and, and uh, he's taking classes to become a Catholic. And I was so happy, so happy, because for 40-plus years of this man's life, or really for his entire lifetime, God played no part. Zero. No thought of God, no, uh, no love of God, no faith in God, no knowledge of God whatsoever. God played no part. We stood there in Wise and he was, he was telling me this and he was all choked up. So I know it's not a a light decision on his part. How I many know you don't get all choked up about things that don't matter? But he had come to the end of himself and come to a place where, where he believed there's a God. To even come in and believe there's a God. And not only that, now, you know, he's, be, he's becoming Catholic because it's, it's what he knows and because he's in, involved in a relationship with a woman who's Catholic. So he's becoming Catholic. But I was so happy for him. So happy for him. Listen, James chapter 5. Says this. It says, confess your trespasses one to another. Pray for one another. Confess to one another, pray for one another. That you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. The eff effective, Fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Now, there's some things in there that we break down a little bit. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Now, first of all, the prayer of an unrighteous man avails nothing. Not, not really. 
what, what they're talking about here is the prayer of a righteous man. A righteous man, a righteous woman, a person who's righteous in Christ. So what, what does that mean? Of course, righteous means to be right standing and right standing with God. So a, a, a person who's a, a believer in the Lord, who comes in, in faith and in, in, in believing God, a righteous person. It also means, that, you know, we look at that word righteous or righteousness, you know, it's not our, it's, it's not our own righteousness, but it, it can never be our own righteousness. It's his righteousness. But the, the, the fervent, effective prayer of a righteous man endureth much. Now, is it possible for a Christian to be unrighteous? Absolutely. Absolutely. I can be a Christian and make some very unrighteous, unholy decisions. And listen, scriptures indicate that, like, let's say, let's say a husband who is ill-treating his wife. Can he be a Christian? Yes. But scripture indicates that God will not hear his prayers. So in that case, he may be a Christian, but he's not very righteous. He's not acting righteously. So therefore, his prayers cannot be fervent and hot. He may pray, but there's like a, a ceiling over his head that his prayers are bouncing off of that's that, that ceiling of unrepentant sin. It just, just blocks that open heaven. Just blocks that communication. Now you know this is true. How many times have you been involved? You've, been, you've done something you knew you shouldn't do, and you go to God and try to pray, and you had a hard time. Right? You were feeling bad about something you had done, you had thought about, you had whatever, and, and, and you knew it wasn't right, and, and, and you'd try to pray and get close to God, and you just felt like there was a wall of separation between you and your, you, you and your Creator. Why? It's, it's, it's that wall that comes from unrepentant sin. Doesn't mean you're not a Christian. Doesn't mean you're unsaved. It just means that you have unrepentant sin that is, 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 is just kind of like blocking up the, the, you know, the channel there, if you will. Interference on the frequency. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man. So now that we've repented of, of our sin and come to God with a clean and open heart. That's all that is. That's all that is. You know, it's just coming to God with a clean and open heart. Saying, Lord, I know that I've sinned in this area and, 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 and asking his forgiveness and, and accepting his, his love and forgiveness. But now that we've done that, what does it mean for effective, fervent prayer? Fervent prayer, effectual prayer, is earnest prayer. Honest prayer. Earnest and honest. It's prayer that doesn't couch itself in, in Elizabethan English, but just cries out to God with the truth and for the truth. It's, it's earnest prayer. Honest prayer. It's, it's, uh, it's prayer that is, uh, even as the scripture says, fervent. What is fervent prayer? It, it, it's hot. I don't know how else to describe it. Passionate. That's a, a good way of describing it. It's passionate prayer. It's fervent. It's hot. It's, it's, it's alive. It's not a, not a, a, a dead thing. 
If you're falling asleep, your prayer's not fervent. It's not passionate. It's not hot. It's not alive. Right? The fervent, effective prayer of a righteous man avails much. And we, you know, the, the, the thing that is, is given to us there to, uh, to expand on that at all is, is the story of Elijah. You know the, the story of Elijah? And, and you know the story of the drought in Israel, right? Elijah prayed that it should not rain in Israel, uh, and, and it didn't rain. Now, you know, this was not, like, Elijah was not a guy who could hide. You understand what I'm saying? I could, I, me, I could go pray somewhere and, and that it's not going to rain in the United States for, uh, except at my word, right? I could do that and I could hide. Nobody would know unless I told him. Elijah was not a guy who could hide. He prayed this prayer openly, publicly. The king knew it. So it'd be like, it'd be like um, you know, the president of the United States knowing uh, that I had prayed and it, and it wouldn't rain except at my word. Now, who do you think is going to come after me? When the crops start failing. Do you know how long that drought was? Three and a half years. Look. The United States is far worse than ancient Egypt. Pharaoh at least knew about seven fat calves and seven lean calves. We don't. What's our food cycle? in the US. It's short. It's short. Very, very. I don't know exactly the answer to that question, but uh, what research I have done on that indicates it's very short. Our food cycle in the US is extremely short. And it's that way all, all around the world. That's why when we lose crops in, in, in one part of the world, nations fall into despair. Right? Elijah prayed. Now, the Bible says in verse 17, Elijah was a, a, a man of like nature, right, to us. We, you know, we think of Elijah and we think, oh, you know, this guy did all these miracles. This was such a great man of God, etc. And yes, that's true. But what was, what was he? He was a man. He was a man. Anointed by the Holy Ghost as a prophet of God. Yes, but he was a man. And he fervently prayed that it should not rain. Now, you know, if you're going to pray that, I hope it's God-inspired prayer. You know? But he fervently, earnestly prayed that it would not rain for three years and six months it did not rain. Now, as the crops failed and drought hit the land and the crops failed again and the drought worsened, don't you think that everybody and their brother was after Elijah? Yes, they were. And finally, he prayed again in 1 Kings uh, 17.1. We see where he prayed to stop the rain. Then in 1 Kings 18, uh, verses 41 to 46, we see the, uh, the, the story there. I'm sure you're familiar where he gets down. He prays, and, and he sees, a, you know, the third time he sees a cloud ex like, like a hand of a man extending out of the, out of the, the ocean. And finally, eventually, that, that just comes over the land and, and, and the rains uh, come. And, uh, but Elijah was a man like we are, with like nature as ours. In other words, he had the same kinds of weaknesses and the same uh, uh, 
problems and, and he, he struggled with uh, faith. We know, that, we know that Elijah struggled even with faith. There was a point where he was ready to die. He had given up completely. So, you know, he, he had given up so totally, he was like, Lord, there's none left, just kill me. Right? He's ready to die. That's how complete he felt his failure or the failure of the, of the nation or how complete he felt that, that he was done. He was done. Ready to give up completely. So this year, as we, we look forward to the things that, that we know that God wants to do for us, we look forward this year to a year of breakthrough, a year of increase, a year of, of strength, a year when we uh, uh, grow in the Lord personally, numerically, financially, a year where maybe uh, things that have held us back for a long time, where we deal with them openly, honestly, fervently as Elijah did. As we look forward to this year, how can we participate? How can we move from spectating, even in our own lives, to participating spiritually? It's the one thing I believe we neglect immensely. It is prayer. And it is praying in tongues. It is praying in tongues. In that same book of James, I believe it's James that says, you know, that uh, when a man prays in tongues, that he edifies himself, that he strengthens himself. I don't know about you, but I need some strength. Don't you need strength? I need some strength. You know, it's tough enough to, to do the things that you have to do day in and day out at work. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm like you. I get up 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock in the morning. Usually I'm at work by 5, so most days I'm up at 4. I get home 3, 3.15, 3.30, so I'm working 11 hours a day, right? Plus some Saturdays. It's a lot of hours in a week, Right? And, you know, I'm, I'm not saying that because I'm anything. I'm saying that because you understand. You deal with all the same things. You may not work the same place I work, but you're working or you're dealing with your situations in life and you're doing the, the different things that you have to do. And, and it's a full, there, there's a fullness to the calendar that, that we must be um, purposeful about in order to have the ability or the time uh, to spend time praying uh, and praying in tongues. Again, I encourage you to read Bishop's book, 70 Reasons to Pray in Tongues, 70 Reasons to Pray in the Holy Ghost. Romans 8, I believe it is, 26, tells us that the Holy Spirit takes hold together with our spirit, takes hold together with us. When we don't know how to pray, how many times do you not really know how to pray? When you have a, a, a circumstance or a situation, you know, you just don't really know how to pray. There's many, many times that that happens. When that happens, what's the best way to pray? Pray in tongues. If we, if we pray, um, so to speak, in our thoughts or in English, but we don't really know what God's will is in the circumstance, what are we doing? Very possibly just beating our heads against the wall for no purpose, for no gain. Right? Kind of like a lot of Penn State's plays yesterday. No gain. No gain. Right? Isn't that right? When we pray without knowing God's will, 
We're praying in English, and we're just, they're just words flying out in the air. No power, no authority, no worth. See, we don't get to pray what we want to pray or what we want to see happen and expect God to answer our prayer. That's our will. But we say, your will be done, not mine. Right? So what, when we don't know the answer, when we don't know the outcome that is God's will, How do we pray? Tongues. Tongues. Because the Bible tells us that he who searches the hearts, now who is that? The Holy Spirit. Knows what the will of God is. So when we pray in the Holy Ghost, we are praying God's will. When we pray in the Holy Spirit, we're praying God's will. And that is always a prayer that God answers, that God can lay, lay, uh, grab hold of with us and, and uh, you know, bring something to pass in the earth. So often we, we, we pray not really knowing what God's will is, not really... Uh, understanding what God's will is. So then it, we're almost may at times be praying disunity, even with God. We're praying, you know, the, the Bible teaches the power of unity and the, and the power of agreement. But if we're not in agreement with God in our prayers, we're, we're sowing discord in the spirit. We're sowing uh, uh, a lack of agreement in the spirit. So, uh, you know, is it any wonder sometimes that our prayers uh, seem powerless? God's will. We must be praying his will. And the way to do that is praying in tongues. Now, I'm not saying we, that there isn't a place to pray in English and all of that. You know that and you understand that. But... Elijah was a man like us, became discouraged, struggled, overcame. He overcame, outran the chariot, right? He overcame. God fed him in a cave, right? God reached him when he was in that cave. So whatever cave you're in today, God can reach you. Whatever struggle you're enduring, God can, can reach into that struggle and, and with you overcome. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, whatever your, what your will is for each of us this year, Lord, we pray for that to, uh, to be done. We pray, Lord, that uh, whatever the circumstances are that you're desiring us to, to come against this year in our lives, the sin that uh, besets us, the uh, struggles that we face, Lord, whatever those challenges and those things are that you desire us to overcome, we pray, Lord, that you would speak them to us now at the head of the year, at this early season of the, of the new year, Father, and you would help us to enter in to a time of breakthrough, a time of triumph, a time of overcoming of the enemy, Help us, Father. Lord, we give you our, our ways. We turn our, our ways over to you today and say you have your way with us. You have your way with us, Lord. You have your way. Father, we love you. We bless you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you as you go today. I encourage you today um, that it's not too late. I don't want you to make a New Year's resolution, but I want you to seek the Lord. And I want you to see what God is saying. What is God saying to you this year? What is God saying as we start out this new year? Uh, what, what is there to overcome? What do we need to be fervent and hot about in prayer? What do we need to... Uh, uh, to wax strong 
in, in areas? What, what do we need to overcome and not allow fear uh, to hold us back? You seek the Lord and see what he's saying to you. See what he is saying uh, to you. Amen? Amen. God bless you. God bless you as you go today.